Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 7th edition Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game rules by Chaos. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try very hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast may include mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc. that may bear resemblance to entities living or dead is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your keeper. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I'm your keeper, Keeper Michael, and we return to Horror on the Orient Express, where some of us are traveling, but more on that later. We hope you've been enjoying the campaign to this point, and um, if not, you're at least listening, which is fantastic. You could do so on YouTube, you could do so on a multitude of platforms, Apple, Spotify, etc. But we want to thank you especially for listening. And for you Patreon supporters, we want to thank you for supporting the show. You can do so at patreon.com slash the old ways podcast. And now we'll get to introductions to my right. Hello, this is Mike, and I play James Robert Fraser, who has just heard some rather alarming news. Indeed you have. And to his right. Hi, this is Rena. I play Lady Elizabeth Fitzroy, and I did my best to save Miss Bellinger, but there's only so much a lady can do. Yes, Pontius Pilate is here, already washing their hands at the end of the table. Hi, this is Giles, and I'm playing Simon Griffith, and I'm prepping my sticks of love with five-minute fuses. Good to know that your stick of love has a timer. And last, but most certainly not least. Hi, this is Miranda, and I play Maggie Bellinger, and I'd like to see him fucking catch me. Fantastic. Uh, We are again in the Missing Professor formation. Perhaps he is somewhere amongst the threads of existence, dowsing for Miss Bellinger as we speak. So we're going to open the curtain tonight on a late afternoon, Constantinople, where Miss Bellinger has just exited from the safe house and is making her way up the street with a bundle of white cloth and some items inside. A large bundle. (laughs) Yes, a large bundle. Um, So I would ask Santa, to whose house are you going? I don't, you know, I didn't have anywhere in mind in particular. I have some thoughts, though. One, I don't have to find them. They're finding me because why wouldn't they uh, if they obviously are want to worship me? But also I heard something maybe about like, I don't know where the mosque is because I didn't see the map. But that it is run down, no one, why would anyone go there, something, something like that. And I think that's where I would probably start asking around in the most innocent, touristy way that Ms. Bellinger uh, could. And I know they got information at the market before. So the market is separate from like this scholars area, kind of, right? Is that right, Mike? Yeah, so... The market itself is rather large. Then offset from the market is this place where there's this scholars area where many scholars hang out. Mm -hmm. But the market area is some distance from the house itself. You can actually look down the street. There's a bit of a decline in elevation and you can see the more centralized commercial areas of Constantinople. I will start heading in that direction, and if there is a shop along the way, I will pop in to ask some questions. Hopefully they understand my English or my very poor French. You pop into a shop. You have a few words with the shop owner, who doesn't understand English very well. He understands little bits of French, and he tries to help you. What if I speak very loud? Always a key thing as a foreigner visiting somewhere, is to speak louder when you believe you're not being heard. It doesn't seem to help, and so you speak louder, because you know you're right. And eventually, I guess maybe his wife comes around the counter and tries to help, Mm -hmm. tries to talk to you. She reaches out to very gingerly just sort of put a hand on your forearm because she sees that you're a little animated. And when her hand touches your forearm, you start hearing English. Ooh. And she says, what, what are you looking for? I'm looking for, I'm, I, I be, it's a mosque, but it's 
it's worn down. They said no one would go there. It's it's in a horrible shambles or disarray or something. That they it's strange that that's that's the the, the spot. Well, there are many masks here within Istanbul. I'm sure there are many beautiful ones, but I would like to find one that is not beautiful. She sort of not recoils, but takes her hand off of your arm and then looks at her hand. And you see that in the pool, the palm of her hand, there's a, a black fluid that begins leaking out of her body. She screams in terror. Oh, oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I'm terribly sorry. That, that must be from me and I'll kind of like one hand like grab some like sh- skirt cloth and try to like pat her hand. You grab it some skirt cloth. She steps back and continues to scream. Her husband comes around the counter and grabs her. And when he grabs her, sores open up on his body immediately. And his body begins vacating blood and fluid. And they turn into this horrible wreck of skin and bone right here in the shop floor and become a burbling pit of flesh. Please roll sanity. So my disadvantage puts me at 66 over 64. Okay, so you're going to only lose one point of sanity for that. It seems like a normal everyday occurrence to me. It does. It, eh, oh, whoa, that's terrible. Uh, I guess I wasn't supposed to stop here. Well, this is the the second city that we've gone through that has this just wrecked with sickness. You turn a little bit because there's a noise at the front of the door. It's another person coming in to the shop. They put eyes on you and then put eyes on what's beyond you. Oh, no, you must not come in here. And I'll kind of walk towards them. And be like, say, Some, there's something is wrong with these people. You walk towards them. A wave of flies comes off of you and it intensifies into a gout of these buzzing and biting flies. They make for this new visitor's mouth and burrow directly into their mouth, filling their the mouth cavity completely. And the person begins to choke on live buzzing flies. Uh, can I try to help them? I want to try to like open their mouth and like, get, get, get out. What are you doing? This, what is happening? You can go to help them. If, are you going to use two hands? Oh, well, I have my bundle in the one hand. You do. But I, so I keep it in my hand. It's one of those things where you keep it in your hand, but you're still trying to use that hand. It's just awkwardly like thrown over my shoulder, but I, a Maggie wouldn't put it down. Okay. You try to help them clear the, clear their mouth of these terrible flies. You hear their neck pop, like as you would when someone cracks their neck or, or maybe their knuckles and their head turns to you at a very strange angle and the flies clear from their mouth long enough for them to say the skinless one will not be denied I know I won't but I have to find the mosque where is it the body collapses like jelly Maggie would be I don't want to say distraught but I think close to that like this is frustrating so she might run out and kind of run down the street and find, like, if there's an alleyway somewhere away from people that she can duck down. But she's not going to avoid people on the way, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, you run right past several people who are going about their day. I'm going to assume, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Maggie's not stopping to make sure that they're okay or that something isn't happening to them. Her focus is getting herself to safety, yes? Uh, pretty much, Yeah. And just like space. Certainly. So you run for space and you find yourself eventually in an alley. This is probably half a block, if that. There are a lot of alleyways in Constantinople. You find yourself in a bricked up, mostly, an alleyway that has a a few brick buildings, perhaps some other stone that's been used here. It's mostly quiet. It's dingy. It's dirty. The people here, the few that are here, are at the far end of the alley and you get a chance to breathe and you realize that like your lungs are filled with phlegm, heavy. Your chest heaves at trying to keep up. Certainly. Yeah, you slowly remove the bandages. Even before removing them all the way, you see that you're seeping through. 
these bandages. The red, which was there before, is now black. And there are little bits of white in that black. Strange. Some sort of infection or... I'm not sure. Or Can I take my... Remove my bandages a bit because I want to check my wounds that I have. If I look at them closely, are they organic or inorganic? We'll say that they're um, inorganic. Mm -hmm. Does want to be under my skin. I do know that. Is there... I look around. Who would know the city best and possibly be part of this group. Are there any little like street urchin kids around? Um, maybe. You probably have to go back towards the street. Yeah, I'll do that. Like I will steady my breath, um, try to catch it even if I can't breathe as deeply as usual, bandage myself back up, make sure my pack of uh, simulacrum parts is nice and tight. And then head back out into the street to see if I can find a little a little street urchin there. They know things. Maybe that's the better place to look. You tighten up the bag a little bit and you try very hard to catch your breath. It takes a minute or two. As you walk back towards the street, a truck drives down. It passes the alleyway very slowly. And then as it eventually does clear the alleyway, you hear the brakes of this truck sort of seize. Long squeak. You're making your way towards the alleyway and a man steps in to the alleyway. He's short. He's probably no more than 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, and he wears a dark fitted cloth tunic. And it's a man you've seen before. You saw him outside your hotel in Sofia before it burned to the ground. Oh, have you come for me? Are you going to take me there? I am. You've been waiting for me. I'm sorry that I... I didn't know it was you and Sophia. You were trying to get me here, I'm assuming. Indeed. You have somewhere to be. I do. He gestures out towards the street. With the people or, or? No, above the people. These ants are nothing. I, I couldn't agree more. Finally, someone that understands. We have preparations to make for your coronation. Oh, yes. I hear that the skinless one will not be denied. Yes. He smiles a wicked knife's edge grin at you. Yes, it is time to take speech and make it fact. Baggy gets this like glowing smile on her face and will where he gestured, she'll start to walk in that direction. He walks you towards a truck and helps you into the vehicle. He seems unaffected like the other people were. The problem that you had earlier, the sickness. As you look back and, and get into the truck, Look around, you see that the street has become puddled with people. Every shape, every age. It doesn't matter. Living being, human, animal. All of them have turned to goo. It's best that I left then. It's best that I left them there. I did this for them. That's what Maggie tells herself. The truck drives off. Back at the safe house, as... Lady Elizabeth and Jonah make their way through. I want to get some perfunctory things out of the way if we could. Lady Elizabeth, I'd like to make a hard intelligence roll. And I'm going to make one for Jonah as well. We're going to see how well the two of you do on this incantation correction. That is a 26 under 65. Okay, good. So you both have hard successes. The format of the ritual is going to be sort of one-sided. So... The only portion of the ritual that he is going to translate is the unmaking of it, the breaking of the simulacrum. There is the option to for both for you to work the rest of it, which is to how to put it together and claim it. But he doesn't think it does anybody any good. He is going to, with his his fast learner talent, he's going to utilize that to cut the time in half. So what would normally be two days, since you're only working on one portion of it, 
would be one day. And so what he'll do just by himself is cut that down to roughly 12 working hours. With your assistance, he cuts that in half again. And so you have basically six hours. You'll have the ritual ready after nightfall. At least what he believes is a working writing of it. Writing everything down as quickly as I can. I don't think it would go terribly long, to be perfectly honest, before Fraser or Simon might realize that the house is a little quieter than it normally is. I think Fraser is concentrating primarily on getting the information that he needs from Jonah in order to go and speak to this fella, Akhtar. He gives you the location to find Akhtar, and he suggests that, as he said before, you be prepared to, to pay handsomely for what we ask for. What do you recommend in, in uh, terms of a, a fee for his services? I would suggest it could go anywhere between 100 to 200 pounds. 200 pounds, then. Right. It depends on what you ask him to do. So he'll ask what you want. Is, has he, he's provided me with a list of requirements, hasn't he? That's, I think that's what he was saying. Yeah, roughly he's asking for 10 men with rifles and no questions to appear at a location yet to be determined to basically cause an enormous ruckus. Jonah adds that if the group wants to potentially ask him to find a way to get into this mosque, then it's something that he'll have to, you'll have to determine with Akhtar at that point. Uh, I wasn't sure if there was, there was other stuff that he was wanting for the ritual as well. I got the impression that he was, he, there were you know, sort of ingredients or something maybe. That's something as well that Fraser wants to uh, double check whether they have an idea of what, if anything, they need in you know physical uh, items that they might need for the ritual so he can get those while he's out as well. Jonah would probably impart to you that the only requirements of the ritual are people and blood and that that is all that's required. A consecrated knife, but that's easy to provide. What do you require the, of the people? How many people do you need? Do, do I need to uh, ask this man, Akhtar, to uh, find volunteers to assist us with the, the ritual? The, what do they need? Do they need to hold hands in a circle or something? Is that... Yeah, I, I know you're not trying to be flippant, of course. You're very serious, I'm sure. But from what I have read of the text so far, reworking this ritual into a, a workable form, it's going to require five to six people. But what do you need them to do? That's what I mean. Stand there and be prepared to sacrifice. Sacrifice their lives? To die for this? Is that what you mean? Or, uh, please, I, I need... I don't understand this at all. I need the, the specifics, you know. Right, and that is the problem. The translation still needs to take effect. We need to still do the translation. I, don't, I can't give you those specifics yet. What I know is that five to six people are required to enact the ritual. That could mean all sorts of things. It could mean that you stand there. It could mean that you give blood. It could mean that you give life essence up. It could mean all sorts of things. We're going to have to wing it a little bit. I'll see what I can do. I've got the man's name. I know where he is. And I'll speak to him and see what else he has to suggest in terms of assisting us in getting entrance into the building uh, as and when we need to. Simon, are you coming? Or have you got uh, other matters you need to attend to? Uh, Simon steps out of his room with an assembled Thompson and two straps of dynamite. Right, well, you're ready to go, aren't you? I, I'm not entirely sure that um, we should be walking down the streets of uh, of the city carrying all that when we're going to go for a, uh, a business dealing. So do you want to come with me or do you want to wait here for uh, for, for the word to go to the uh, this, this mosque or... I think I'll leave Mr. Thompson here for now, but I think it might be an idea to bring the explosives with me at this point. Why? What? What? We're going to talk to a man. We're not going to blow anything up. What do you need explosives for? I don't trust anybody in this city. So what, you're going to throw dynamite at them? Yes. I would say, Simon, and don't take this the wrong way, but if you start going, throwing dynamite around while we're going to meet a man to make arrangements for what we have to do later on, we might not get a chance to do what we have to do later on. Because the, because the police will come. Who knows what's going to happen? All right, Jim. I just think dynamite is a little ex of an extreme solution to what might be a, 
or any problems that we might encounter while we're going to speak to th this man. Later on, I have absolutely no issue with it whatsoever. If you want, you throw as many sticks of dynamite at, the, at, the, at these, these bastards as they're trying to do whatever it is they're trying to do later on to help us destroy this thing. That's fine by me. All right, Freddy boy, because you asked nicely, I'll go ahead and leave him behind. Uh, so Simon is going to leave the two wrap sticks with fuses and the Thompson on his bed in his room, and he's going to cover it with comforters. Okay. Right. Come on, let's go and speak to this man, Actar. Okay. The two of you head back out and you go to speak to Actar. Finding him is not terribly difficult, given that you have directions. It's back down towards the center of the city. It's on a different side of the city than the market was. With a little traversing, you find uh, a pleasant spot. There's actually a couple of beautiful buildings here right on the waters and uh, a nice pond that's sort of been made into a centralized location. There's a, I guess you'd call it a bar or a cantina nearby. There's live music being played. The cultural differences aside, this man Akhtar is likely very rich if this is the place he traffics at. It's not exactly what I was expecting. When Jonas said he was a, a smuggler, rather thought he would be more of a hands-on kind of a man, but uh, it seems that uh, he's the man who runs the operation. Go to where I was directed to by Jonah and see if I can get an idea of where this man is and how I can speak to him, if there's, you know, like a, a, a personal assistant or something that I need to speak to in order to gain an audience. So you inquire for at the bar for Akhtar, and it doesn't take very long to get directed towards a giant of a man. He's got to be six, seven. He's huge. Not so much of a, a big beard as is very traditional here in Constantinople, but he has a very wide cut tunic on. He wears an awful lot of very expensive jewelry. And uh, he's sitting at a big table with all sorts of food and drinks around. There's several men around the table here who are enjoying the music and Akhtar is plucking food, which looks so tiny in his enormous hands. Simon, I can't, I can't help but think that this might be more uh, your uh, realm of expertise uh, speaking to a man uh, of his um, particular... Sure, I'll take the lead on this one, Fred. Hi, hi, Louis. Hi, yes. I'll uh, I'll keep my eyes open. I have I have the money here. The, should you require it, I have two hundred pounds. Mister Actor, uh, if I presume, he turns. You see his gaze leveled at you. You come to speak to Actor? I do. One of our associates recommended that you might be the person to talk to you to uh, help with some circumstances. It is very late in the day to do business. How about we do business and pleasure, sir? Right here? Right here is as good as any, don't you think? Unless you, you prefer to do your business elsewhere. But then I would understand. No, no. Hear him sort of call out to the table. Give us the space. Six guys get up from their seats, three on each side, and they step away from their meals and their drinks. Which, if the attempt was to be discreet, probably not the most discreet reaction you could have hoped for. But it's done. Simon's idea on it is if Akhtar is here with his crew, the entire bar is aware of Akhtar and his crew. And they'll be fine with it. Mr. Akhtar... You have a great spread here, by the way. Let me just say, uh, how does Actar compare in size to Simon? What's your size? 70. Yeah, he's a little larger than you are. His size is probably 80. He's a very big gentleman. But Mr. Actar, um, my associate, Mr. Jonah, recommended that you might be able to help us with a small problem. I see. What is your problem? We need to be taking care of something that might cause some noise. If you are able to set up some form of distraction to draw folks away from that noise, it would be appreciated. I see. 
So you're seeking physical assistance. How many bodies do you need? Mr. Jonah recommended ten. Ten. And where would they go? Well, we're going to a vocation. Fred, could you help us out here? Hi, Louis. What, what do you need? Mr. Ektar, my, my friend Fred here is the one who knows maps and could tell you better where we are currently, where we need to be, and where we could use ten strong strapping men that you could uh, offer us for, of course, the commensurate fee. You see Actar sort of mouth the words strapping? Like he might not understand what you mean. Uh, strapping also can mean armed. Ah, Yes. Yes, I understand. Actar invites you to sit at the table, Fraser. Hmm. Nod and thanks, and if uh, if a drink is offered, I will gratefully accept it. Certainly. You see a um, an older man come up to the table with a small tray, and he begins sort of replacing some of the food that has been eaten with fresh plates. He offers you wine. Thank you. You have good health. Could I get a coffee, sir? Of course. The elder man smiles at you. He walks around the front of the table, the end, and taps Actar on the shoulder and says, that's enough. Actar stands up and walks away, and the old man sits down, sets the tray on the table. Mr. Actar, I presume. You may presume. The real Mr. Actar, of course. What is the name and if it is not a target. I understand that you're looking for mercenaries, recruits. Yes, that is correct, sir. Very well. I can offer you each man at 10 sterling a head. All right. Do you need to know where we are going to be? Well, of course. Simon will take out the piece of paper he still has. That one side has the gentleman's name but the, in Arabic, but the other one has Shun Mosque where he wrote it in English, and he slides that over to him. You see Akhtar furrow his brow. This building has been getting a lot of attention lately. Aye, we believe it is being used as a base of operations for a very uh, unpleasant type. I have no doubt. I have no doubt. It has not been used in many years. It is altogether quiet. Only the decrepit go inside. Thieves, beggars, invalids. We believe that um, something is going down in that building, or is about to, and uh, we wish to prevent it because, well, apart from anything else, it would not be good for the city or its people. It would not be good for business either. Your reason is immaterial to me. The money is what is important. How many men? Mr. Jonas suggested ten. If you could offer more, we'll take more, but we need a good solid distraction. And if you do have a way in, that would be wonderful. Otherwise, we could make a way in, but it would be quite loud. Well, if you are looking to get in the mosque... I may have a way, if you are willing to pay for it. Oh, I, I think we could do that, if you could tell us this way. At least give us a general idea, up front first. Oh, I could take you there. And? It would cost about 500 pounds. That is a very steep fee. It would, unfortunately, uncover certain portions of my own personal network here. I would not do so for a trivial amount of money. I would do so for an extraordinary amount of money. But would that 500 pounds include your 10 strapping lads, as in armed? Suddenly. Fred? He grins. Well, certainly that is a, a high fee. What would be covered by this fee? You show us a, an entryway where we can uh, subtly gain ingress into the building and your men distract and otherwise uh, take care of anyone who would try and impede us in our pursuit. 
We believe it will be guarded. The route I would show you, we would walk directly under their noses. I believe I understand what you mean, sir. Well, I do not have that kind of money about my person. Hmm. If you do. It would be foolish to carry that uh, that larger sum uh, through the streets unless one was uh, heavily guarded. What say you, a small deposit? No. And the rest to be paid closer to the time. It's agreeable. 10% now, 40% when we're ready, and the remaining half afterwards? Mm, I think 40% now. I will have to call and acquire the men and the arms. You will still have to provide me a time at which you wish to use them. I'll be paid in full before I take you on my route. In the spirit of uh, your people, of their way of doing business as I understand it, let us say 300 pounds for the job, all told. Simon is watching the guy's face because he has a feeling that Jim may have insulted him. Fred, hold on. He holds his hand up when, when he sees your body language change, Simon. It is perfectly reasonable to discuss the price. Negotiations begin with the seller telling the customer how much something costs. It's clear Jim is not interested in paying 500 pounds sterling. And whom would be? And so I will say that because I find your tenacity interesting, 450. 400. 400 and you tell me when. Very well. As soon as we know when, we will provide that information for you. Half down now. Agreed. He extends his hand. And Fraser will extend his hand in return. You two shake hands on a deal. Akhtar informs you that his men will use pretty standard rifles, that they're all trained how to use them, and that when you have a time where you wish to wish them appear, they can begin their work. Just in terms of getting the information to him, um, does he have someone that would be closer to where we are that we can just pass the information to, or would we have to come all the way out to tell him and then go all the way back in again? No, he has, he has an entire network of runners that work from... Network, that's what I was hoping, yeah. So we'll, we'll make arrangements to, uh, to let him know. So the two of you leave and head back to the safe house. In the ensuing journey, you begin to hear voices and reports near the safe house of something strange. There's a calamity. There are extra people in the streets. It's the, really the first thing that you see, Fraser. What's going on here? It looks like there's a mess in the streets. I think the, the best way to convey it is it reminds you of some of the things that you saw on the lines in France when people would be hit by cannonballs. It's like an obliteration of a person and the mess left thereafter. Jim? That's not us. What's going on here? We should tell the others. Come on, let's get back to the hotel. Uh, to, the, to the safe house. Uh, Simon slips a hand into his pocket to uh, grab his pistol and hold it there. You get back to the house. I'm kind of guessing that if we go up, we'll discover that her ladyship and Jonah are deep in consultation with the books that they're working on. It does appear so, yes. So if they're not available, we'll go and see if we can find Richard and Maggie. Mm -hmm. You uh, go to Richard's door and knock a few times. He doesn't answer. Is it locked? I don't really know if the professor would lock his door. I don't especially think that he would. So we'll say that it is not locked. I'm going to open it a crack just to make sure he's all right, because... You know, we've had we've had situations where people haven't answered their door before, and it's because they're being attacked by disembodied hands and shit like that. That's very true. Um, you crack the door, and you see him uh, on the bed, laying on the bed. There, he seems to sleep. 
Okay, I'll just close it again. I won't disturb him. I assume he's okay. No vampire tigers or anything. Looks fine. And I'll go to Maggie's door and knock on her door. There's no answer. Again, I'll test it to see if it's... I'll say, Miss, Miss, Miss Ballinger, it's, it's Mr. Fraser. I'm, uh, I'm just wanting to check on you. I don't think this door is locked. It would be very difficult to lock this door. Again, crack open. Just um, Miss Bellinger. It smells weird in here, Fraser. It's sort of brackish a little bit. There's a strange scent on the air. It's blood. Simon, Simon. Something's going on. And I'll, I'll kind of burst into the room, basically. Simon draws his pistol. Yeah, I think I'd draw my pistol as well. You burst into the room, you turn the light on. On the floor, laid out, is blood. And an awful lot of it. There are smears of bloody footprints. There's also another material in the blood. It's something darker. It's definitely different than the blood, visually. But there are two things that are not in the room. Miss Bellinger. And as far as you can see, any of the simulacrum pieces. Because that trunk is wide open. She's been taken. And she's been wounded as well. What? What is this? I'm, I'm going to kind of have a look at this other whatever it is that's in, in the blood. Well, the scent that comes off of it is really strong. To give you an idea of the scent, it's very close to a really strong clove. It's Paul, Paul, Paul! Paul comes rushing in. Uh, Simon is going to look at the floor with this uh, substance on it and a tracking roll to see if he can note any footprints and where they go. That's a seven. Um, you see bloody shoe prints that leave this room. Very light. Paul ducks his head in. My God, what happened in here? I don't know. So, I think somebody's taken Miss Ballinger. Did you hear anything? Did you see anything? No, no, I was uh, getting some rest. I didn't hear or see anything. Richard's fast asleep, but her, her ladyship and, and Jonah are deep in their research. Oh, we should... We shouldn't have left left them alone. Oh. Hey, Jim, check out these footprints. Or shoe prints, as the case may be. I'll be with you in a, in a, in a moment, Simon. Yeah. Paul, what is this? What is this? He looks at it on the ground. It's definitely not blood. Let, let me get um, some of my equipment. I'll get a sample of it. All right. What, what is it you found, Simon? I found shoe prints in this uh, substance uh, exited in the room. How, how many? Well, and, uh, Simon shows it to him. How many sets of shoe prints are there? Well, technically there are two. Um, technically there are two, but they would be of the same shoe. Yeah, there are two sets of prints. Probably, um, given the track roll, there are two sets of prints. There are two different sets of prints. One is a likely a smaller shoe. One is a larger shoe. Would Simon, with that with that track, will be able to tell that the larger shoe leads to Richard's bedroom? It would, and the that sort of track roll would also tell you that the smaller set of footprints is fresher. I relay all this to Jim. Well, where, where does it go? Come on. Well, the larger set goes to the professor's room, and these are older. There's only one set leading out. Uh, that's the fresher ones. That's the newer ones. About how old would I say these are? You'd say that they're less than an hour? Paul comes back in and scoops up some of this black, viscous material. Paul, I, I'm, I'm beginning to think that Mar Margaret's gone off on her own. You might be right. He swishes the material around a little bit and holds it up to the light. And in the light here in this room, you watch that black fluid sort of cling a bit to the side of the tube that he has it in and he swishes it around and when it stops when he stops moving it the material doesn't stop it keeps going and then you see the fluid roil like it's being boiled like it moves on its own what the hell is that i don't know but i'm going to get a stopper right simon we have to go we have to go and find her of course we do which way do the footprints go, uh, Mike? Do they lead out of the apartment? They go out the, the door of the apartment. 
damn, she was quiet and she uh, walked right past while the others were reading their books. Well, lead on, Simon. I'm in your hands. It's at the front door here, and I'm assuming that I will be following these down the stairs, correct? Certainly. You can follow them down the stairs and then into the street and then eventually down the street. And they don't terribly go far, unfortunately, who are trying to figure out what terrible things happened on this street. Oh my God, oh my God. Which is centralized around a shop owner. One of these shops seems to be the sort of central focus of what's happened. I'm going to stride up towards him, um, the shop owner. Hey, excuse me, do you speak uh, any English? You stop at this shop where these things have taken place, but you don't see the owner. You see other people here. Does anybody speak any English? You hear a French-accented English voice call from across the street. Uh, I do. Uh, uh, hello, uh, have you seen uh, a young woman? And I'll describe what Maggie looks like. I was just um, get, getting tea in, in the cafe here, and uh, I did see the, the woman you spoke of. Yes, uh, she, she's a, a friend of ours. Uh, she's, she's, she's a little disorientated, uh, and uh, she's, she's uh, wandered off on, on her own, and uh, we're, we're a bit worried about her. You don't, didn't see which way she went, did you? Oh, uh, uh, she got into a truck with another man. Into a, a truck? Yes, uh, one of those flatbed trucks. What did this man look like? Oh, um, looked like a local fellow, dressed in uh, dark clothing. I thought he was maybe perhaps a teacher or perhaps her instructor for Arabic or something. She had a bag over her, a sheet or something over her shoulder. He didn't by any chance wear a fez, did he, this, this fellow? Oh, indeed, yes. Uh, which way did the truck go, if, if, if you... If you noticed, could you tell me? Uh, down, down the street there. Can, can I ask, what? why are there the crowds here? Did something happen? Yes, it, it seems that the shop owner and his wife here, it's rather grisly. It sounds like something happened to them. I haven't seen inside the shop, but everyone who stops by says that it's... All I hear is that it's horrific. They're they're praying for them. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry to hear, hear that. Thank you very much for your uh, your assistance. Very kind of you. M much appreciated. He nods and heads back towards, assumably, his the, the cafe he was sitting at. Come on, Simon, we have to follow that truck. You toddle off and seek to find a truck. So, Lady Elizabeth, over the next several hours, you and Jonah have an experience. It's probably the most rapid translation you've done or at least assisted with. You're picking up at light speed certain parts of Arabic. Less the purpose and meaning behind the words, but more like what words look like. And then deconstructing a ritual and then reconstructing it into what you need it to be. It's during this time that you feel the presence of your mother and that sort of nigh eternal wisdom that her children have. And you learn some very important things, which I'll lay out for you here. There is a way to complete the ritual and not necessarily have to sacrifice everyone, but someone must pay the cost. That cost can be stretched over one person or two, two people or three people, etc. The cost may consume everything that they have or it may consume only a little bit. It all depends on how the witch ritual is worded and the people who are there. You need at least five people present, including whomever is going to cast this ritual spell, to enact it. All the pieces have to be present. Otherwise, the breaking doesn't take place. Five people, that's doable, theoretically. The other thing that you learn in passing is that Jonah's name isn't Jonah. Oh, Jonah's name is Julius. Interesting. Um, the two of you are treated, I guess, to food Paul makes for you. It's at this unfortunate time that Paul tells you that Maggie is missing, as are all the simulacrum pieces. There's a very unladylike 
Fuck. Which of course shocks everyone. Of course. Jonah puts his pen down. Well, that is a really big wrench in our plans. Do we have any idea where she went? I assume Fraser and Mr. Griffith are on it. They're looking for her. Who knows if they'll find her? Who knows if she ran away or if she's been kidnapped? But if she's been kidnapped, they've taken her and the pieces. And that means they have everything they need. Do I think I have enough of the ritual at this point to work? Like, have we done what we set out to do with that? I'm not sure how much time has passed. You're probably into, we'll say, the four or five o'clock hour. You're close to having, say, 70% of it. Do you think you have enough? Maybe. You can try to tie some of these things off or try to make what you think are the right intonations. Jonah picks up the pen again. If you need to go after her, I understand. But I think we, uh, we've got to keep working. We need to finalize what we have here. Yes, I agree. As quickly as possible. But it wouldn't do us any good to run after her without knowing how to stop it. No, and it could be exactly what they want. Quite. I dealt with a cult like this in France once. They pick off people one by one. They put them in places, open places, where you can get to them. And all it is is just a bait. The two of you redouble your efforts. In the time that the boys spend searching for Miss Bellinger, which assumably will be at least a couple of hours, you and Jonah complete the spell the translation of it. It's about three pages long and you hope that it contains enough in it to break the simulacrum. I think that's what we're going to get. (sighs) Yeah. Hopefully they've got backup coming. Now, if they figured out a way to get to this place, actually get to it, maybe you just go in there and do your best to deal with whoever's there and then make this spell happen. I I don't know. I think I'll just act on what I see is the best way I know how to do things at the moment. Can't really plan in this sort of situation. That's for sure. He closes up the tome and hands it back to you. Thank you for all your work. Sure. I was here to do a job. You've done it very well. I hope it works. Me too. He stands up and heads out of the room. And now, because we can't possibly leave this episode without looking in on Miss Bellinger. Maggie, the truck takes you around town a little bit. As it does, many youths climb onto the back of the truck. They vary in age from maybe six to 16. And everywhere this truck goes, people climb aboard. They all have the same look, really. They wear a little bit of ratty white linens. Some of them have headdresses and scarves wrapped around them. Others don't. The truck wanders almost listlessly for a little while. All the time, your chauffeur, your friend, maybe not friend, is fairly silent. But eventually, the truck turns into a small courtyard outside what looks like a moss that has seen better days. When he does so, everyone on the back of the flatbed truck gets off. Some of them tuck inside the mosque, others head to the outside of it, and they begin what looks like some sort of standard lineup of where they take what's in their pockets and they seem to dump it into these urns. You don't hear the tinkle of coins, you don't hear anything that would sound normal like to give to an urn. There's almost this sound of something heavy and wet being dropped into these urns. But he opens the truck door for you and gestures to the mosque's open portal. As I walk in that direction, do I walk past any of these urns? Oh, sure. Can I get a peek at what they're dropping in or what they have dropped in, what's inside? Yeah, absolutely. It's flesh. Oh, cool. Great. You can go ahead and take your sanity roll now. Okay, thanks. I like if Mike doesn't call for a sand roll here, I don't fucking know when there will ever be one. That is a 79 over 63. 
Okay. Um, I'm going to say this is probably a D4 sand loss. Uh, and that's four. So go ahead and lose four points of sanity. So this scene begins to, to grip at you. And you realize that they're dumping what is assumably live or was recently live flesh. And there are four or five urns and there are 10 or 12 kids. And where did all this flesh come from? And it begins to sort of race around inside your brain. And you hear it behind from behind you. You hear Makarot's voice say, are you ready? Now you might jump a little bit at the sound as this is racing through her head and, and she turns quickly to, to see him. Uh, yes, I, I believe I am. Wonderful. Up the steps then. He begins to walk up the crumbling steps of the front of this mosque. Yeah, Maggie heads that way as well. Inside, the mosque itself is fairly open. The, the smells, the scents that you were greeted with are not pleasant at all. There is a sense of death and decay here. There is a sense of people decaying inside. Many of the youth that you saw outside get off the truck and make their offering lay now against the walls inside of this mosque. And they seem almost spent of energy. For Makrat's part, he walks strides forward without any concern for them. I'm assuming he's, I'm still carrying all of the pieces, correct? At the moment, yes. Yeah. My step might slow a little bit, but I, I would want to keep up with him if we're, I mean, time is of the essence. Lady Elizabeth said, I live eight hours. Certainly, certainly, certainly. He takes you to a room inside the mosque. There's a door there and he opens the door and as he does, he gestures for you to enter. There are large library-like shelves here. So think of a big collegiate library where shelves line the walls and the shelves are twice as tall as they normally would be. You're describing it in a beautiful way. <laughs> oh, I, I might be, but, but let me disabuse you of that notion. There's no beauty in here. Oh, okay, good. The shelves contain parts. That is the best way to put it. Because I was thinking books. Probably from the word library. What is what is on you? The information, the shelves themselves, are not filled with books. They're filled with parts. Oh. Parts of people. Oh. What else is in this room aside from shelves of parts of people? It's pretty deep. So it's about a 20 foot deep room. And then there's probably a good 60 or so feet as you enter. Like it's a pretty large room. As far as what else is in here, there are other men. They seem to be, I guess, cataloging is the best way to put it. They're turning parts of these pieces. They seem to be racking and re-racking them like a jigsaw puzzle almost. Maggie might even kind of drift over to one side and look more closely at some of these pieces herself reach out and touch some of these jars. Okay. So the jars, the, the, the ones that are jarred are pretty dramatic. They seem to be jarred in a fashion where the contents are kept personalized. And so it's not just a room of dead flesh, but it is really a trophy room seemingly to the people who have been captured. You assume captured, or perhaps the people who've been brought in who are devoted to it. I'll, I'll kind of out loud to anyone that would listen. Were these given freely? There's a good, long, healthy silence. And Macrat steps beside you. Freely. Oh, uh, I guess donated? He seems to stare at you in a strange way. Or were they taken? Tell me. Do you ask the butcher the same? Oh, I don't, I don't know if I've ever spoken to a butcher, honestly. Certainly you have now. Oh. I have one in particular here you might be interested in. You do? Hmm. Okay. Just down this way. Oh. He walks you down the many 
tall rows of shelves and you get towards a corner and you see a jar. It's probably as big as like one of the real big pickle jars. Mm -hmm. And you see him sort of tap one of the other people in the room on the shoulder and he points to the jar and they turn it around slowly, inexorably. And you see the white and gray sort of wispy hair and the face comes across and it's the face, a face you know. Mm -hmm. And it's Dr. Julius Smith. Oh, thank goodness. Ooh, okay. Oh, I, I did know he was dead. I saw him in a, in a, well, it wasn't a dream, but it was another place. Hmm. Yes. His was not a willing donation. Oh, I, I wouldn't imagine so. He tried to stop me from a number of things. Yes, of course. He tried to convince me that this was the wrong path for me to take. Well, it's, of course, Miss Bellinger, it's not a path that many could walk. And truth be told, it's not one you'll get a chance to either. He touches you on the neck. Make me a power roll. Okay. Put. Those are both bad. It was an 82 and a 92. <laughs> either way, it is a failed power roll. It sure is. You pass out. You collapse on the floor. The lights go out. The last thing that you remember is the uncurling of your fingers on the linens taken from the safe house. And that is where I'll call our episode to a close. And so we've staged all of our pieces properly. And now we await the final sessions. And so thank you for joining us on this episode of Horror on the Orient Express. I can't wait to see what happens next. Thank you and good night.